Good afternoon. My name is Gail Wright. I'm with Partners Resource Network. We are the Parent Training and Information Center for uh, the state of Texas. And we are funded by the Department of Education and Office of Special Education. And what we do is we provide free resources and training to parents of children with disabilities. Um, some of the things that we offer, we have four projects. They are PATH, Team, PN, and PAC. Um, I'll post in the chat box here my contact information so you'll know how to reach me. Okay. Allison, is it, is it, is it the Q&A or is it the chat box? Which, which one should I? Um, yeah, I think the chat box is going to be a, a great spot okay. for that. Okay. I'll post my contact information there. Today, um, we are um, having a presentation, which I hope, I hope everybody's able to attend. It's information that I've been waiting. I've had parents ask questions, so we are glad to be at this opportunity. And we thank Consolidated Planning, Ms. Allison and Ms. Ms. Attorney Linda Wilson for helping us to make this become Lisa. a, 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 a a presentation. So uh, I'll turn it over this time to Miss Allison and so we get started. So we get started. We appreciate all of your time. We know that it's lunchtime and we just appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much, Gail. Thanks for having us again. It's nice to be back with you. Um, Allison Scalber, Consolidated Planning Group. Um, we are a holistic special needs uh, financial planning firm. Um, we do a lot of webinars on a regular basis. So if you're coming back to us, um, you've, uh, you've been with us before, we're glad you're back. And if you're uh, new to us, then we're glad you're here. Um, I'm super excited uh, today to be partnering up with Hayes and Wilson, Lisa Wilson um, specifically, and she's going to be talking to us uh, today about guardianship. So Lisa's a bit of a legend, and um, we're really we're really glad that she's here. She's been in and around uh, the Houston area for a very very long time. Um, she is a, a, vetcher, a veteran warrior mom of a, a of a special needs uh, child that has crossed over into adulthood. So not only um, both of us, um, you know, from that perspective, um, we eat, sleep, and breathe this. We live this um, both professionally uh, and personally. So, um, so I'm excited to, to just turn everything over to you, Lisa. Thank you for being with us. <clears throat> Will you share, us, uh, share with us a little bit more about Hayes and Wilson and a little bit more about yourself? Sure, so Hayes and Wilson, we're a small law firm. We do estate planning. Um, so we draft wills, trusts, powers of attorney. Um, we also administer estates when someone dies and we do a lot of guardianships. Um, there's uh, three attorneys right now, at Hayes and Wilson and support staff. And my particular niche has always been working with families with special needs kids. As Allison said, I, that's my situation too. I have a 33 year old daughter with Down syndrome. And um, she is held up as an example when I'm giving presentations all the time. Here's what we did with her, or here's how, uh, how she responds and, and et cetera. So, um, so. So, so today's, um, today's meeting, we do, um, we do want it to be interactive from a, from a chat box perspective. Um, today's meeting is being recorded. Um, after this um, meeting, either later today or tomorrow, um, you will get an email uh, with this presentation and the recording. Um, so, so just know that that will be out there. So um, your, your cameras and your microphones are muted, but we do want your questions. So as you have questions, as we're going through, we will be monitoring the chat box and we're going to be answering just as many questions as we can. It's 12.05 and our um, big mission and we'll, we will end by one o'clock. So on or before one o'clock, this was scheduled for an hour. So sometimes people like to know that as well. So. Okay. So I'm going to talk about guardianship and the question of when guardianship is necessary and appropriate has changed dramatically in the last few years. There has been a huge cultural, philosophical and legislative shift away from guardianship. Our firm, at one point we tried to calculate, we probably do about half the guardianships we used to do. And most of our guardianships are parents obtaining guardianship of their children with disabilities who have reached adulthood or are about to reach adulthood. So the question um, 
uh, of whether to obtain guardianship, we used to address it by just say, yeah, why not? Go ahead and get the guardianship in place. It's kind of a safety net. If you ever need that authority, you have it. Well, again, it's just a very different world out there. And we can't go to court and say, yeah, we want to remove all of this, per these per this person's rights just in case something might happen in the future. Um, that just doesn't fly anymore. So um, what we now have to show the court is not just that the person has some significant functional limitations. The first bullet point there is really the statutory definition of incapacity. And that used to be all it took, you know, was a doctor's evaluation or a statement that this person was unable to obtain for himself appropriate food and housing or medical treatment or manage their finances, you were there. Now we also have to show the court there really isn't any way to support this individual in maintaining their own autonomy. And I find this a little bit easier to illustrate if I'm talking about um, like your mom who might start to have some memory issues. Um, maybe we get her a bill paying service if she's getting confused about her finances. Maybe we get someone to come into her place a few times a week to organize her medications, cook a few meals, do the shopping. Um, keep her organized, but we're not going to, at the first time things go wrong, go to court and strip her of all her constitutional rights. Now, with our kids, it's a little harder to find these supports um, that we would put in place in lieu of a guardianship. Number one, we're already doing everything for our kids, pretty much. It's not like there's all kinds of supports and services out there that we've ignored up until now. And also their, their issues are a little more pervasive. So it's a, it's a challenge. Um, and we also want our kids to be independent, but we want that safety net too. So the guardianship really becomes an issue the way I look at, in sort, at it in sort of three general arenas. And one is just managing your child's care. If you have guardianship, you can make the appointments, you can get the records, you can talk to care providers, you can talk to the school, you've got that authority. Um, although I, I wanna mention too, there's an awful lot of people out there in the world who don't understand what a guardianship is. Um, so sometimes it takes really asserting your authority as the guardian. Um, but generally you're stepping into your child's shoes with that right for information and management. The second area that guardianship could potentially become compelling is the medical arena. And for routine visits and treatment, maybe not so much, but what if your child needs a procedure done or some test that is high risk. From a medical provider's perspective, they have to have a patient who can give informed consent, who can say, I understand this might kill me or this might cause serious injury, but I'm weighing the pluses and minuses and I wanna move forward with this procedure. And so if a doctor doesn't have a patient who can give con informed consent, they need someone with the legal authority to do that. And the third arena, unfortunately, is financial and personal exploitation. And it happens. Um, somebody's talked into signing something, or, you know, I have just a handful of stories, not a whole lot. I mean, if there's a vulnerable person it seems like there's almost somebody nearby who's going to take advantage of that. But, but we see um, the elderly targeted more for that than our kids. So I don't have a lot of horror stories about our kids with, with watchful parents. 
But those stories do happen, especially as you're also trying to foster that independence. For example, mom goes over to her son's apartment and all the furniture she bought for him is gone. Well, my friend wanted it. So I gave it to him. And all of my clients say, but my child is so kind and so nice and, and they really want friends. So sometimes they're, they're easily victimized. Um, so again, those are, those are generally the three arenas where guardianship may be the most compelling. But the law requires us to really fully explore other methods to protect and support this individual before taking their rights away. Lisa, um, I have a question. Um, sure. So if we're like looking at the slide, you gave that example. So, I mean, I know that a lot of the families that we serve, this example of this informed consent of a surgery or something like that, and, you know, everybody has, you know, they're on different playing fields, but a lot of the kids can't, they don't know, they wouldn't know what they were signing. Um, this mental capacity, I, the, the, the definition of IDD of an IQ of 70 below, does that come into play when we're thinking about guardianship or not? So that same individual that couldn't sign a consent because they really don't know what they're signing, they also couldn't sign a healthcare prior of attorney either because they wouldn't know what they were signing, right? Right. So that person may be a really good candidate for guardianship. Got it. Yeah. Um, so the guardianship, so I'm basically going to talk about the guardianship and then the alternatives. And, and there's, again, there's sort of three choices, three routes to go. So the guardianship is a court proceeding. A court begins with the presumption that your child is perfectly competent and your burden of proof is to show that they're not, that they have significant functional limitations and they need to have somebody else put in place as a surrogate decision maker. And they lose the right to do things that can't be placed on a surrogate decision maker like driving, voting, or marriage. Um, the court monitors this relationship. There is a guardianship of the person there's a guardianship of the estate. Most of our kids don't need a guardianship of the estate. They may just have a little bit of income if they get benefits from social security or, or maybe significant income, but the court really has you deal with, so, with social security administration for that. Um, or we may you know, deal with any money that might come to them in another manner in order to keep them financially positioned to be eligible. So most of our kids were doing guardianship of the person only, which gives the guardian very specific rights to consent or refuse medical treatment, decide where the person lives, advocate for them. They have a duty to make sure the person's got a roof over their head and food and medical treatment and, and um, is cared for. So I'll talk more later about what the process for obtaining a guardianship involves. But at the front end, you're gonna you know, consider, is this the route you go? This means you know, your child loses these rights and that's real tough for a lot of kids to contemplate that. Um, another route to go is a power of attorney. So this requires, as Allison was sort of um, mentioning there, it requires a certain level of comprehension you've got to understand the kinds of powers you're giving your agent in this document. The agent is the person you would name to handle matters for you. There's a financial power of attorney and a medical power of attorney. So most of us here should have one in the event we become incapacitated, we name someone we know and trust to have access to our bank accounts, to pay our bills, to make medical decisions for us. If a child has a milder disability and can understand that at times they do need somebody to assist and act for them, um, that means that person can sign for them, can talk to the bank. Um, 
the agent should always be acting as an extension of the individual and should be acting in the principle, the individual's best interest as they would have. Um, excuse me while I take a drink of water. Sure. Um, Lisa, I actually have a couple of things on these, these power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney. And, and I know that we're here and we're talking about special needs, but as we're talking about power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney, um, I just, just, just like you to write it down. If you're, if you're taking notes today, write down um, to check on your aging parents. Do they have these documents in place? So A, do you have this document in place um, that, that if, you know, if someone becomes incapacitated or what have you that, and, and, but do your aging parents, and this is really important, for instance, you know, we have aging parents that are affluent, they have money, they can pay for their care. But if, and, and if the power of attorney is in place, somebody has a stroke, they don't die, but they're incapacitated, they have the inability to pay their bills and things like this, this is going to help whoever they appoint to be able to handle the, their affairs. And so, so that's one thing that I would say, um, is very important. It's just important to have these conversations and think about this and have these documents in place before something happens. And the other thing, um, it's not just your aging parents, it's your other neurotypical children that are going to college. Um, they've turned 18. Um, they, you know, they don't have special needs. So it's just something to think about there too. So I always just like to add that in there, Lisa, um, because it, the, when it comes to the healthcare power of attorney and power of attorney, it really applies to most everyone. Yeah, that is very true. Um, good advice. So I, I actually have one other question because um, as it relates to guardianship, we talked about taking away their rights. They can't vote, they can't get married, they can't drive a car. We talked to a lot of families that say, you know, I think I need guardianship. If we take the picture right now at 18 years old, and we look at the individual, you know, my child, he's not there yet. We're still hopeful and we're still optimistic. So what my question is, um, if a person needs to go down that highway right now because they're not there yet, but they're still hopeful and optimistic, is there any turning back? And is can, there, can this be temporary and we change it later? You have to go through the same process to restore rights. So if parents are appointed guardian, they can't just a little while later say, you know, we don't need this anymore. Let's just drop it. Um, once, a guard, once a court has determined that the person is incapacitated and needs a surrogate decision maker, the court really is obligated to have one in place. So the parents can't just, you know, not uh, continue their obligation to the court. The court may appoint somebody else to be guardian of their child. So it does require a restoration and it's the same process. We start with the doctor's evaluation. There's a court appointed attorney for the child. There's a court investigator. So when you go through the process, I've done them. I've done a restoration of partial rights of a right to drive. I've done a complete rest. I've done two complete restorations. Those were really unusual circumstances. Well, one, the person was in a coma from a car accident and then they came out of the coma. Um, another one was, um, a young man who had um, a mental illness and he became very stable, was good about taking his medications. We did a full guardianship at age 18 and at age 28, we did a full restoration. So there is, um, there is such a thing as a partial guardianship. Um, and this is another way that the guardianship has really evolved over the years. Um, you know, I used to tell clients, yeah, if your kid, if you think your kid might want to drive, just ask the doctor to check that box that he can operate a motor vehicle. Um, now, with this additional charge, more or less, to create a guardianship, again, not only that the person has functional limitations, but that there's no supports or services that would um, allow him to, to make his own decisions. <clears throat> It's sort of a higher bar to reach to take someone's rights away. So you're producing a doctor's evaluation that says this person can't reason logically, can't break down complex tasks into small steps. So it's really hard to then argue out of the other side of your mouth, well, they should be able to drive a car. 
you know, we've just said they can't um, reason logically. Um, getting married, um, same thing, you know, that's maybe the biggest or one of the biggest, biggest decisions we make in our lives. So it's hard to argue on one side how impaired this person is in their judgment and thinking, but retaining this right. So even though by statute, we can carve out uh, a limited guardianship, they're very rare. And the driving issue again, which used to be relatively common, um, I, I tell my clients now, if you want your child to be able to still retain the right to drive, don't even go the guardianship path because we'll spend a lot of money and then have to you know, back out and dismiss because the courts, we just are not seeing that now. Um, so, um, so something else you said, Allison, kind of made me uh, trigger about the um, limited guardianship. And again, that sort of higher hurdle to create the guardianship initially. Is and limited those, and partial the same? Like when you yes. say limited guardianship or partial, it's kind of one and the same? Yeah. Okay. So what we're looking at typically is um, how else do we protect and support this person? And, you know, I tell parents, you, you, be creative. Is it, if you're really worried about him or her, you know, signing something, um, can you put a credit freeze on his social security number? Or, you know, can you take some other steps, think outside of the box to provide the protections and support for this person? So the support, so back to the powers of attorney, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about those. So the, um, there's the financial power of attorney, there is the medical power of attorney. So a financial power of attorney can be made effective immediately. Um, as a matter of fact, I tell all my clients to do that. You know, if you want someone to step in and handle your finances, if you become incapacitated, the most efficient way to do that is to have it be effective immediately. And while you're in the hospital, they can check with your bank and see what's going on, whatever. A medical power of attorney is very different um, you can't make it effective immediately. So it only becomes effective when a doctor determines you've lost the ability to make your own medical decisions and that's certified in writing. So if your child signs a medical power of attorney or a financial power of attorney, there's a presumption that there's enough understanding there that they know what they're signing that they know they want parents to help them with financial matters, to be able to access their bank, you know, that kind of thing. There's, there's got to be this presumption of understanding. Um, otherwise it's not a legal document. You know, if you put, if I prepare a legal document and put it in front of a client and have them sign, knowing they have no idea what they're signing, first of all, that's an ethical violation for me. And, um, it's not, it's not a valid document. So, and I have been asked a number of times to um, do an affidavit that when my client was sitting in my office signing, they, they fully understood what, what it was that they were signing. So the medical power of attorney becomes effective once the person loses the ability to make their own decisions. So if it's effective today, when your child signs it, because we've determined that your child has enough capacity to make their own medical decisions and to um, sign this document, then the next day at the doctor's office, you don't have any authority. You know, there has to be some event that would trigger the parent's authority to make decisions. Um, so, I, so we have um, we have some questions um, out here um, that I want to I want to chat with you about. So, one of them basically you're saying from a guardianship perspective, if the child is already driving, for instance, and they don't want to relinquish their driver's license, then I think I heard you say that guardianship is likely not the right route. Is that correct? That's correct. I've had a number of cases where kids have been driving for a few years, no incidents, 
and the court, you know, we moved forward the guardianship for other reason, the court took away the right to drive. We've gone in there with all the notes from the driving instructor on how well this person was doing. And the court said, no. Um, I have another case where the court just, as soon as we filed it, the court called and said, we don't do that. We don't do a retained right to drive. So. So you, you mean as soon as you file, you because you guys tried to say we're doing the guardianship and retain the right to drive and they just said no. It, right. That, it has to be just a flat out no. Yeah. Can you um so so let's say in the example, so we're talking about um kids that maybe are not IDD or whatever, they have the capacity to understand they've turned 18, maybe they're high functioning autism, ADHD, any myriad of any other, you know, diagnosis is out there. And they understand what they're signing. They sign a power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney. But um, so, can you talk about that, that? That that individual reserves the right to revoke that at at any point. So, if we have kids that are volatile, the teenagers that are volatile or are ang you know angered easily or things like that, can you talk about how that could become an issue? Right. So the guardianship again, by comparison, takes away the person's rights to do certain things. Um, and it's um, permanent unless you go through the restoration process. A power of attorney does not limit what the principal can still do. So they can still go sign a contract or give away their furniture or, you know, they, they can still do anything that any adult can do. And yeah, when, when things are going great with the parents and the child is pretty compliant, um, and the power of attorney is just acting as like a, an extension or sort of the hands and eyes and ears to get the business done for whatever the child needs. Great. But as soon as there's any sort of difference of opinion or hostility um, between parent and child, that's, you know, then the power of attorney may not be effective. You know, I've often wondered if you, you know, if you're in front of a third party and the child says, well, I don't want you talking to my mom, um, you know, he's basically revoked it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's limited in its effectiveness um, as compared to the guardianship. But, but again, it's, it's, um, you know, we talk about it as an alternative to guardianship, but you know, it sort of isn't because if someone can sign, understand and sign of a power, a power of attorney, they arguably don't need a guardianship. And if someone needs a guardianship, the implication is they don't have the capacity to sign a power of attorney. So, you know, it's just kind of a funny way we talk about it as an alternative, like you could, you could just pick, um, but you, you choose, but it's really, what is appropriate and necessary what's and and i would say and i and you said you use yourself and your daughter as an example and i i do the same with um with my my daughter so i have an adult daughter and this is the direction that we went she's of sound mind um her disability affects mobility and her body it doesn't affect her mind she, you know so this was a good fit for us. And, you know, she, you know, we have, we see families where maybe their kids go in and out of the hospital. They have other diagnoses and sometimes they're with it and sometimes they're not as a result of illness that is related to their um, disease or disability. And so this may be, you know, so that's where it fit for us. Like, so there was no, no stretch of the imagination guardianship was not a good fit for us at all i mean it's not even a remote consideration the supported decision making that kind of thing and 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 again i think everybody is in 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 different you know different capacity some people have kids that don't walk they don't talk they you know they're you know they have intellectual disabilities and i mean there there's no capacity there's never they're never going to drive i mean so so I think I think the thing is, is and and what we're trying to convey is that we're there. Are, there are options, but everybody's situation is so uniquely different. And and what I wanted to say is, this is where it's important to work with somebody like Lisa on these matters because they're they're going to be able 
Um, it's not that you have to decide all of this. When you're working with a professional like Lisa, she's going to go over with you. This is what the court is. This is what we're going to have to show the court because this is a court proceeding. This is what they're looking for. And, and, it, and it's a whole process. So it's okay if you don't have the perfect answer of which one is right, because that's, that's what they do is help you kind of help you get there. Um, does guardianship have to be renewed annually? Someone asked Lisa. Yeah, it does have to be renewed. It's pretty minimal. You mail in a page and a half, fill in the blank, circle the answer form with a $12 fee. So there's not much to it, but at least, you know, most of the work I do is in Harris County. And these are pretty sophisticated judges regarding guardianship and probate because they're specialized courts. Um, Montgomery County now has a specialized court, Galveston, but other counties like Fort Bend, they're just in the county court. These judges are amazing because they have to know, you know, license revocation and divorce and contract disputes and guardianship and probate. But the more it, in Harris County, um, well, I, you know, and, and I, I guess it's fair in all counties. The judges are personally liable to the people under guardianship. They have to take reasonable steps to know that this person in their jurisdiction is still cared for, that they've determined they can't take care of themselves. They need to know the parents are still there, still alive, you know, just at a bare minimum. So it's a simple form. Most parents, you could sit down and fill it out in five minutes, mail it in with your check for $12, but the courts take it very seriously. They'll read it. Um, and, um, you know, if it's not on time, you'll get a letter. Uh, if you still don't send it in, you'll get served by the constable and you have to come in and make an appearance in court. Um, it's kind of baffling to the judges. A lot of times the parents will go through all of this to get guardianship and then blow off that annual report. But, but it is really important. It's pretty minimal. You know, normally you don't have to go to court if you mail it in. So, they, it, so um, in that of, example, they don't go to court. I think that that was one of our questions in the chat box. Um, if they don't turn this in. So you said that they'll, you know, they'll serve them and they'll be asked to go to court. But in the event that they don't show up to court, um, what happens? Does the guardianship, is the guardianship over? Or, I mean, not that people are planning on doing that. I mean, I is what happens? So that's what I was saying at the beginning, the guardianship doesn't go away. You know, if the court has determined that there's a person within its jurisdiction that can't manage their own affairs, um, that's sort of, you know, the guardianship process is sort of a two part. One, can this person manage themselves or do they need a surrogate? Second, who's the best person? Generally, it's the parents that are applying and they're determined the best people. But if the parents aren't following through, um, and they're not responding to the court, the court really just can't say, okay, this person's going to be off on their own now. They appoint somebody else. Um, so, um, so this form, is there a place where um, someone asks, can they um, download this form or will it just be mailed to them? This, this form that you're, the renewal form that you're speaking of? Yeah, I think in Harris County, anyway, it, it can be downloaded. Most of the courts are really friendly and helpful to the families. Um, we used to, my firm for years, you know, I've been practicing for 25 years, and I think last year or the year before, we finally gave up the reminder letters because it was just, that's a lot of cases over 25 years. We finally had to let it go, but we used to send the form with the due date and the you know, form of payment where you mail it. Um, we just can't do that anymore. So I told my clients, it's on you. You know, the court generally isn't going to remind you. Most courts won't, but they'll let you know if you're delinquent. So just, you know, like anything else that you have to do once a year, your, your letters of guardianship have an expiration date. So that's a helpful reminder too, that it's going to be time to renew. Um, but yeah, in Harris County, it's downloadable off the county clerk website or just call the court where your case is and say, hey, I know I'm supposed to file something. Um, you know, what do I do? Where do I get it? They're usually really, really helpful to the parents, to the families. We have a lot of good questions and I know we're going to um, keep moving. But one one question, and uh, I've actually never heard this question, I think is a fabulous one. Um, so if I have guardianship of my child, my child does something illegal, how does that affect me? So if I have guardianship 
and they they break the law, then then what happens? Yeah, so there's a statutory provision that says a guardian's not liable for the actions of the ward. Otherwise, nobody would ever want to be guardian. Okay. But you know, I tell my clients just you know be reasonable. First of all, if somebody wants to sue, they'll name everybody. It might be that you you wouldn't be stopped from perhaps defending yourself in a lawsuit, but um, you know, you're not automatically liable. Sure. Okay. Um, someone says there's some new legislation that's coming up about guardianship. Do you um, think that this will make it easier for parents to get guardianship or, or harder? I don't know what that is. So, okay. Maybe I should, but I don't know. So, okay. You know yes. <laughs> um, okay. And then we have another likely, one. Likely harder because that's sort of the whole it, shift. It's, it's you know, in, now yeah, it does like it's the movement of, of yeah. making it more difficult. Parents, uh, family members used to not have to go through criminal background checks. Now family members do too. It used to just be if a non-family member was applying, parents now have to go through criminal background checks. Um, they have to do a training video, video. They have to register with the state as a guardian. So it's, there's a lot more to it. So my guess would be that that would be because the, the reason for these changes in the law was self-advocates, people with disabilities getting in front of the legislature themselves or through their advocates saying, okay, we make bad judgments, who doesn't? Do we need to just routinely have all our rights taken away from us? Um, so that's where that all is, uh, that change is coming from. So my guess is that that trend would be continuing. So we have two questions um, related to um, transferring. Um, and then also, so A, is there a such thing as co-guardianship? So could um, husband and wife, mom and dad be co-guardians? Yeah, in Texas, co-guardians have to be husband and wife or joint managing conservators and divorce decree. Or if they were appointed co-guard, you know, if they aren't husband and wife or co-managing, they were appointed in another state. So I have a case I brought over and it's um, uh, mother and sister are co-guardians, but that would, so they still are here, but that couldn't initiate this way, that way in Texas. Very easy to transfer guardianships, certainly from county to county in Texas, super easy, and generally from state to state too, as long as it's current. Um, we often need an attorney at both ends in each state to kind of wrap up in one court, but it, it's all the time. We, we do this all the time. So what about in an example, someone put in the chat box, um, how is it transferred in, in this case, mom has guardianship of um, a learning disabled brother and mom is losing her memory. So um, in that example, I mean, I think that this is something common that, that, that does happen, happen with aging parents. Um, what, what do you do on something like that? So we either have mom resign or get a doctor's evaluation that maybe she can't handle those responsibilities anymore. Okay, and then that's just, you know, brought to the courts and then, then they make it. Usually decision. we do it as in one application, you know, mom signs off as I'm resigning in favor of my adult daughter stepping up and taking over or something like that. Or if mom's already lost capacity, then, you know, maybe a doctor's evaluation is a part of the application for the successor. Okay, so talk to us about this supported decision making. Is this something that's specialized to Texas? It's kind of a buzzword we hear about all the time. What is it? Should we be excited about it? Not excited about it? Talk to us about that. So supported decision making agreement. You know, again, the, the three sort of avenues, guardianship, absolute, complete, takes the rights away, um, power of attorney, the principal is allowing an agent to act for them, but they still retain all their rights. The supported decision-making agreement, um, the document itself kind of recites that the real purpose is sort of just an authorization for third parties to freely and openly talk with the people identified in the document. So typically if I'm preparing these for a family, 
the um, adult child with a disability will name parents, sometimes an uncle or aunt as well, sometimes older siblings as supporters. And then in the document, um, they can indicate, um, I need help um, with financial um, matters. I need help with um, physical health, you know, going to doctors. I need help finding a job. And so whatever areas are indicated, the person is giving permission to third parties to talk. So when it first came out, um, we were all like, huh? Because it doesn't really do anything. But now that it's been like five or six years, you know, I, I haven't had anybody come back and say, well, that didn't work. You know, so it's it's out there and it's being used. I, I don't have a lot of follow through, but people are aware of it. They're coming in and asking for it. Um, when you're when you're contemplating, you know, which route to go, I always feel like you haven't gone down a path that can't be reversed if you do supported decision making. Because you've got your, if it, if it turns out that, you know, we didn't know at the time, but really guardianship is probably what we need. You've got, you know, you've got your, your, your evidence to the court, your honor, we tried the alternatives. We really tried to support this person, our family member in making their own decisions. The supported decision-making agreement in the document itself, it says, that the supporters are to talk with third parties, gather information, go back to the principal and say, okay, here's, here's your issues, here's your choices, and help them make a decision. And then if appropriate, communicate that decision back to third parties. So it really is sort of like a HIPAA authorization, but in a, in a much broader sense. Now, I think, it should work, like I think in the school districts, it would be perfect. You know, why not? I, you know, I need my parents in here at the ARG meeting because these are complicated decisions I can't make by myself. Do I need to have all my rights taken away in court for my parents to be here? No, this is perfect, you know? So there's some scenarios where I think this would be ideal for a lot of kids. It is Texas specific. We're told no other state has anything like it. Um, although I have seen other states where there is such a thing as like a court appointed advocate. So I think it might be something like that. So that parents can go to court and be appointed an advocate without having rights taken away. So can um, you have both? Could you have um, in this example, so we're not doing guardianship, they have a supported decision-making agreement. Could they also have the healthcare power of attorney and power of attorney in addition to, and, and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, usually if the person has enough capacity to understand the supported decision-making agreement, I, I figure we're kind of there on the powers of attorney too. Um, so usually on the financial, I'll do kind of a simplified power of attorney, financial power of attorney. I mean, our, our, our typical one talks about gifting for estate tax purposes and that kind of thing that's not generally going to be relevant. So we can do a really a, a simpler financial power of attorney that they can understand. Medical, again, that's such a strange animal because, again, it's not really effective unless something dramatic happens. He can't sign it and then have the parents be able to make medical decisions. However, my, my clients tell me that all the time. So I'm like, whatever, if that works. Like, oh yeah, I'm able to do everything because we have a medical power attorney. Okay, if it's, if it's working for you, that's great. So typically we are gonna do all those documents as a cluster. Um, now the HIPAA, we still have to do a HIPAA because medical providers have to follow federal statute. So the um, advocacy organization that really got in front of the legislature to um, develop this supported decision-making agreement at one of their presentations, I asked, can't you do a HIPAA light? Because we're having this great conversation with the child and then I have to hand them this HIPAA. Nobody really, under I don't know what this says, but if you can just sign that. 
and they can't because it is federal statute. So we sort of have to just have them sign that because that's what's needed for that release. But typically we are doing the supportive decision-making, healthcare power of attorney, financial power of attorney, HIPAA and a FERPA, which is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act for school. Um, same thing, schools have to follow the federal statute. So we go ahead and do that. And I like to tell people too, Disability Rights Texas, we do the documents and some of the clients really like their adult children to come in and meet with me because I can talk to them um, separate from the parents. The child feels like they're getting their own advice. They're not just doing what their parents want them to do. They get a sense of having their own attorney. But I do like to tell people that Disability Rights Texas the advocacy organization who really does not support guardianships. They have great information and all those forms. So you don't have to go to attorney to get those done. And I think that just is really the spirit of the law. So I encourage my clients to go there, read about it, find out, get their questions answered, look at the form. If they still want me to do them, I'm happy to do them. We charge $450, I think, to produce them and meet with the client and and do everything, but it's out there. And I just think that's fair, you know. You're talking, you're talking medical power of attorney. Is that what you're talking about now? The form, the $450, is that for the medical power of attorney? Or that is that? for supported decision-making, okay. financial power of attorney, medical power of attorney, HIPAA and FERPA. We do that. And, and so somebody had that in the chat box of, you know, can you do this yourself and just get it notarized? Um, Sure. You know, there are places, you know, there are places that you can download documents and other things like that. I mean, historically, the advice that we give parents. Don't do a will that way. <laughs> don't do your will. Don't, and, and, and a special needs trust, first party, third party, don't do that. There's, there's, there's too many, you're making a major mistake. And I can say that like slam dunk, like period. But Disability Rights Texas is a great website right. to find out about yes. those. And that's a good place to get some free resources. So um, you're, so we've got the procedure for obtaining guardianship. One question was, is um, when, when can we start this process? So if we're coming down the pipe, the kid's about to turn 18, what is the earliest time they can start the guardianship process? Six months before the 18th birthday is the earliest you can file with the court. And the process typically and takes about three to four months. So usually I tell people come in to the office at that six month, six month date. Cause that usually gives us plenty of time to. And is three to four months still accurate? I know that we've been in a weird pandemic for the last year and a half, but um, is that still true now, even with the pandemic three to four months about the process that it takes? I know they moved to online and stuff like that, but. Oh yeah, the Zoom hearings are awesome. They're just awesome because- You're gonna hate going back to court. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's interesting because like most of the Harris County courts don't make the kids go to court for guardianship. Um, Montgomery County, you generally do. But this way we all get to see the kid. You know, a lot of times they're at home. With, you know, that'll change, I guess, everybody going back to school. But a lot of times, you know, they, they do get to sort of participate without having to go downtown. And of course, it's nice for all of us to not have to go downtown and pay for parking and go through security. So um, there's paperwork to done to do after the hearing. And sometimes that takes a while for it to all sort of come together. Um, whereas it's a lot more efficient if everybody's down there in the courtroom. But um, yeah, I hope they keep up the Zoom hearings for, for uncontested cases. For, for sure, for it's sure. Crazy. So, so they haven't really got, I mean, Harris County was on it right away. They didn't have any delays. Some of the other counties struggled a little bit, but Fort Bend was a little bit behind, but. Um, okay, so shall I go through the procedure? Real yes, quickly? and we've got, um, so I wanna leave enough time just for a few, for, for more questions. And I, yeah, I want you to run through, we've got about 10 minutes left, um, kind of run through like what a person could expect um, as they're going down this highway of guardianship, we've, we, they've determined this is kind of the route that they need to go. Where do they go from here? Okay. So we start with getting a doctor's evaluation and it is a form 
that the judges around the state have put together. It has everything in the form that the doctor's evaluation needs to address by statute. So we got to have that form. Um, the timing is interesting. We, we the 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 doctor's evaluation has to be based on an exam that was 120, no earlier than 120 days from our file date. So they really want a snapshot. You know, we're not going to provide a form that eight or 10 months ago or two years ago, the doctor filled out. It's, it's got to be this recent evaluation. What are the functional limitations right now as we're heading into this process? So Typically, our firm will, will get that first and make sure it you know, looks rather compelling and enough to move forward on. And then we prepare the petition. It's called an application. And that is just basic information. You know, Leslie is now an adult. She lives in Harris County. She has um, meets the definition of incapacitated under state law. There's no supports and services that would allow her to be independent and autonomous. Um, she doesn't have any assets. Her parents are um, qualified to serve. Um, There's certain things that, that would make you unqualified. That's if you have you know, felony convictions or um, other things. So pretty basic, we'll identify the other immediate family members. Um, and that gets filed. The doctor's evaluation gets filed with the court. The evaluation stays as a not um, public record. So the first thing that happens is the child has to be served by the constable. So this process, I try and remind my parents, the process, again, presumes your child is perfectly competent. You've got a burden of proof because people always say, well, if the judge could just see my kid and I'm like, your kid could be Stephen Hawking's, you know, we can't tell by looking. So what we're doing is we are creating this picture we're saying, here's the doctor's evaluation, here's your allegations, and then there's these other component pieces, and that's what the judge is going to base the decision on. But a lot of this is due process protections for your child. So it, they, the child has to be served by the constable, not a private process serving company. You know, it's just the petition itself has to be sworn to by the applicants, which is not the case in a lot of lawsuits. There are other family members. Um, go ahead and click over to the next uh, slide, Allison. We'll get to, um, if there are other family members who are adults, they're, they're entitled to notice. Now that's of course different from any other lawsuit. If you owe somebody money and they sue you, they don't have to let all your brothers and sisters know <laughs> that you've been sued. So. It's protection for that individual. So other family members can have the opportunity to get involved or object. So in some of the heavier populated counties, the courts like Harris County are required to have court investigators. So they will get formally assigned to the case. They typically have a social work background. Um, historically, of, of course, these were home visits. They're doing them by Zoom generally now. Court investigator's job is sort of twofold. They're gonna kind of verify what's in the petition. No need for a guardianship of the state, a state, the person actually lives in this county, so it's the proper jurisdiction. And they're gonna make their own evaluation on whether they think this person should be under guardianship. So no one element here is controlling, it's just another piece of it. So, so let's talk about for a second, because this some, is something that I hear about all the time. It comes up about in the case of divorce, um, uh, let's, there's the case of the happy divorce and um, mom and dad have joint custody and they want to be co-guardians. Okay. And then we have the example of the, the single parent. Um, maybe, maybe the other parent is MIA or maybe the other parent is adamantly against guardianship how what happens so like this petition they have to be notified and then the court makes the decision and the, if it's against the wishes of the other parent what happens in that case well if the other parent thinks the person doesn't need to be under guardianship and we have filed a doctor's letter they need to file a contrary doctor's evaluation. They need to find and file a doctor's evaluation that says this person is competent. They can talk about it all they want, but 
we got a doctor's evaluation. If they think there's an opinion otherwise, they've got to produce that. And then it may become a contested guardianship about which doctor's opinion and do we get experts and, but they've got to, they've got to get it their own. They can't just own. not want this. They have to be able to prove that it's not yeah. needed if yeah. the other party can prove that it's needed. So in the example of co-guardians, going back to that, because we had a lot of questions on that. And I know that you said a married couple could be co-guardians, but um, the, the, the parents, whether married, if they're divorced or maybe they were never married, um, can, can they be co-guardians in that example? Is, is that allowed? Yeah, if they're joint managing conservators. Okay. That's the, if they're married or joint managing conservators in a child custody decree. That's, that's the only way in Texas. Okay. So, so the child actually gets served and then the attorney ad litem works with the child themselves and the attorney ad litem also provides an opinion to the courts? Not really. Well, sort of. The attorney ad litem, their job is to represent what the child wants. So their job is to say, you know, is to try and communicate with the person about what the guardianship means. Do you understand you're going to lose your right to drive to marry? How do you feel about that? So the attorney ad litem's job is not to represent to the court what that attorney thinks is best for the person. It's what the proposed what the individual proposed to be under guardianship wants. That's their voice, their chance. Now, my clients, a lot of them will freak out. What if he says he doesn't want to be? A, I'm like, okay, he has a right to say he doesn't want to be under guardianship, but it doesn't mean we all whoops and go home. We've got a doctor's evaluation. We've got your statement. We've got all, you know, again, it's just a piece of it, but they have the right to be represented. Now, usually in a guardianship, because again, there is this presumption of, of um, you know, not particularly high functioning. Um, you know, when I want to be my most flippant talking about my daughter, I, I say the day before she had all her constitutional rights stripped away from her in a court of law was no different from the day after. I mean, we got to go out and have a donut that day. And that was probably the biggest thing for her. But so her meeting with her attorney ad litem involved a hug. And, you know, the, the attorney ad litem, the presentation to the court was, Your Honor, I, you know, attempted to talk with Leslie about what guardianship means. And I don't think she really understood, but she was clearly loved and cared for by her parents. And, uh, you know, if she could express herself, she would want them to continue making decisions. So you know, it can be quite varied in, in what that experience is like. Um, in the example of a joint conservator, and we're almost out of time, um, is it possible or do, do to fight for a sole guardianship if you're divorced? So if you don't want to be in this joint guardianship mm -hmm. situation, so can you ask the courts for that or would that be considered contested? How does that it's, work? The courts, it, it definitely would be contested. The courts, and when they get contested, we turn them over to the litigation firms, but generally the courts generally take the position and the reason for that statutory provision is the, the guardianship court says, you've already fought about that in the divorce court. Uh -huh. And that's what you came up with. You decided or whatever, or that court determined you would be joint managing. So if both people want to be guardians and they're joint managing, we're going to appoint them. Um, they don't want to have to do that all over again. So that's kind of the point of that statutory provision is that should have been addressed in the, in the divorce court. We're not going to go over it again here. But still, ultimately, it's what's in the best interest of the ward. And so, yes, if, if, you know, one parent can say, you know, this would be horrible for the child to have this person involved in their care or making decisions. And here's why then. Yeah, that that's because ultimately that's what will be the issue is what's best for the ward. One of the, um, you know, in closing, one of the questions that comes up over and over again is, um, can you I, clearly, I, let me preface by saying that you and I know that every, every case is different. Every case is different. 
but can, um, for families that are trying to plan, okay, we've got a kid that's turning 18 or we need to do this. They already, you know, they, they need a range. Can you provide yeah. a, a, an approximate sure. range of what guardianship costs, you know, start yeah. to finish non-contested? Yeah. In the typical case, parents getting guardianship, adult child with special needs, guardianship of the person only. If it's our firm, I tell them 5,500, 5,500 to, for everything, including that attorney ad litem, because they actually have to, families have to pay two attorneys. They have to pay me to represent the parents and they have to pay for the uh, court appointed attorney, which usually the most counties have limited that attorney ad litems. And so that's kind of like all, kind of all, all fees um, involved. So that's at least, you know, uh, something to have on your radar to be budgeting for and, and what have you. Um, what we've got on the screen um, today is just some tips and some ideas that we have that should be on your radar as it relates to planning for special needs. There's so many topics. We have webinars on all of them, um, and we partner with professionals like Lisa um, to talk about the things that, you know, we talk about the things that we're well, well versed in, and we bring um, professionals like Lisa in to talk about the things that they are well versed in. So if these are things that are on your radar, um, you know, certainly um, check out our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that and kind of look at playbacks of other um, other topics that we've had in the past. Um, we've got um, our contact information on here. Um, certainly feel free to reach out. I, you know, I know that we have a webinar, everybody's situation is different and, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. And so if you have questions about your unique situation, um, you know, feel free to, to reach out. Um, we, we hope you will. Um, let me just uh, see if we've got any more just in wrapping up. I am, I'm not doing very good with this, uh, my mouse today. There we go. Okay. Nope. Just thank you. Um, thank you from, from, from everyone. And so again, Gail, thank you for having us uh, today on Partners Resource Network. Mm -hmm. and, and Lisa, thank you so much for taking your time sure. um, to, to be with us. And um, thank you for your knowledge. Like I said, she's a legend. So Lisa Wilson, Hayes and Wilson, they've been around for a really, really long time. You can check them out, check out their website. And I'd just like to thank all of you for being here. And I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Take care. Bye now. Bye.